So Sateros, how you doing? Always good to hear from you, Terry. Always good talking with you. And it's delightful to have you on. And you are the first uh, person that we were talking with for what will potentially be a series of basically uh, mage throughout the ages or the ages of mages. I wasn't quite, I, I don't have <laughs> a witty name for that because otherwise it sounds like this is a mage's midlife crisis. These are mages at menopause. You are here to discuss the 60s. And I guess before we, we really de- dive into it, what do you find so interesting about the 60s or what draws you to that time and place? Part of it's personal. I mean, I, I was born in 1965, and my earliest memories are in the late part of the late 60s and, and very early 70s. That's not only when I you know, became aware as a person, but also when I became politically, socially, and politically aware, which, as anybody who has read Mage knows, is sort of like important to me and stuff. <laughs> My father was in Vietnam, and I remember the moon shot, you know, the, uh, the, the, the men walking on the moon, and, and I remember Watergate and, and you know, the late 60s acts of terrorism and so forth. And also something that makes it a particularly fond era for me in terms of uh, creativity is my father loves music. And he passed that that love of music on to me. Even in my earliest childhood, I grew up with music around me constantly. And this was not like many people in my generation. You know, their parents were listening to, I don't know, fucking Lawrence Welk or, or Frank Sinatra or something like that. My dad loved rock and soul and blues. And so I grew up on psychedelic, especially psychedelic rock, while it was coming out. We would go to places like this, this weird ass pizza place in Hawaii, I think it was, where, you know, everybody was dressed all psychedelic and be playing psychedelic music and the walls were painted all kinds of rainbow colors and stuff. So I saw the yellow submarine in the theater. A lot of my love of creativity, of music, of of kind of magic and odd, bizarre subcultures and so forth comes from my childhood in the late sixties and early seventies. And when I got older and started doing, you know, research on the people who were making that music and those bizarre subcultures and underground comics and things like that, the more fascinated I became with all of the social, political and mystical convergences that came together in that era. And for better and worse, it kind of a, a period of alchemy in terms of the modern history and modern humanity. America, but the world in general, changed radically during those few decades. And someone born after, say, 1990 would find the world of, say, 1960 exotic, if not unrecognizable. Like the late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of what we consider to be magical subcultures and magical practices today originate in the 1960s and early 70s. And within Mage, the, the 60s are kind of an interesting period. We have the dust off in, in kind of the magical timeline. We have the awakening of Garul, which, depending on which edition you follow, disempowers the Nefandi, who are ascendant otherwise during World War II. The technocracy and the traditions band together to this giant ritual to kind of uh, shove them out after everyone kind of realizes that Hitler's up to no good. This magical mm-hmm. Cold War kind of starts. Mm-hmm. And it's an interesting case where if we look at uh, the historical timeline, the 60s through the early 90s are kind of when the traditions are at their nadir of organized power, but also at a time where the cultures that kind of empower the mystical thought that gives them potence are kind of having a a sort of renaissance. When you think of mage history, is there anything in there that people should should really keep in mind? I I guess 1961, the virtual adepts joined the tradition. Otherwise, I'm hard-pressed to think of a mage-specific event that really happens in the 60s. The cult of ecstasy achieves a phenomenal amount of influence within you know, among the masses and then completely blows it. For lack of a better term, we see a, a, one of the periodic things that happens in Mage where a, a paradigm becomes ascendant in sleepers' minds and the groups that advocate for it either succeed or fail in, in capturing that enthusiasm. And I feel like one of the commentaries in the history of Mage is no one ever successfully does it seemingly. Like mm-hmm. the technocracy pulls off the trick exactly once and then over the next three centuries gl- gradually lose control of it and, until we have modernity. So if we're going to talk about the 60s, on the cusp of what you consider to be the 60s, what does the world look like either in the mortal world or supernatural? Like to know what the 60s changed, we need a little bit of an idea of what 
I guess, the 50s were like. Uh, What to you did the 60s come out of? The most dominant force in that era, at least as far as I can tell, is the rise of uh, the, the rise of the United States. Because prior to World War I, the U.S. Is, is essentially a cultural backwater. European and Asian powers kind of look at it and go, oh, well, there's some interesting stuff going on there, but that's just a bunch of hit shooting at, at strange little savage people over there. and We'll buy cotton from them, and they, they invent some neat things over there, but nobody really cares about what's going on over there. This changes around World War One, where, for the first time, a large military expeditionary force from the United States goes over and fights in a major conflict in Europe. Doesn't make nearly as much of a difference as they think they do, but still managed to make a pretty big difference. But a big thing that comes out of the late 1800s, early 1900s that registers in a huge way in the 1950s and 60s is the rise of mass media. And because of some of those innovations that are either created in or in Edison's case stolen in the United States, you go from a period of broadsheets and you know the occasional printed book if you happen to be you know well off in the late 1700s early 1800s radio by the uh, by the early 20th century television by the 1950s the uh, a large portion of those things two of the you know motion pictures originate in France but they become ascendant in from Hollywood and you know of course radio actually was largely invented in the United States and spread and so the influence of American technology and culture by the end of World War I starts to become significant. But still at the beginning of World War II, there's, yeah, well, if we go bomb this harbor over there, they'll stay out of the fight. Oh, well, those people, we'll, we'll worry about them later. Let's take out, you know, Russia, France, and, and Great Britain first, because those are the real powers. By the end of World War II, Every major industrial power has been bombed flat. Manufacturing base has been destroyed. Its population has been destroyed and and massively traumatized. And the the U.S. and Canada were fortunate enough, by accident of geography, to not have their cities bombed. While the rest of Europe, Asia, and part of Africa are digging themselves out, literally digging themselves out of the rubble, everybody's coming to North America for entertainment, for technology, for goods and for people. The shift of attention, global attention, turns completely in the direction of North America by the 1950s. And because of this, Canada and the U.S. end up having an economic boom unlike anything either country has ever seen before. A lot of what we currently view for better and worse, as the golden age of America comes out of that era from the 1950s into the end of the 60s, where combination of high tax base, a feeling of victory, and a whole bunch of traumatized war vets who don't want to say anything, combined with a manufacturing base operating at full tilt, leads to the greatest prosperity the country has ever seen. It's still not nearly as great as a lot of people like to think it was, and it certainly wasn't Father Knows Best, which also ties in with the whole, uh, another element which plays into Mage, is the illusion of America is very much manufactured in the 1950s, and it starts to come apart at the seams during the 1960s and falls completely to shreds during the 1970s. But when you say the illusion of America, what does that mean? The whole father knows best, everything is great, oh, chicken in every pot, everybody's got two cars, you know, rock and roll, all of, all of that wonderful stuff on the surface, you know, that's our happy days era, that's American graffiti, that's, and it's not even necessarily just people on the right wing end of the spectrum, but especially when conservative Americans look at, you know, the, the age of American greatness, it's the 1950s. And if you look at the popular culture, however, there's a really super dark undercurrent there, which, you know, among other things, in- involves that whole traumatized war vets, you know, people coming back from the war and not talking about it, but they're drinking themselves to death and they're beating their kids and they're cheating on their wives or husbands, but nobody's talking about it. And that's so the layers of the illusion get built up during the 1950s with the cleansing and censoring of, uh, of media and the selling of this this illusion i keep using the, that word but but it's true that this this facade 
that everything is great, that everybody's prosperous, that everybody is happy, and that it's always going to be this way because America is awesome. Now, if you watch the series Mad Men, that's a perfect deconstruction of how that illusion was false and the way that it starts falling apart at the beginning of the 1960s. Because, you know, Mad Men takes place 59 to 64, roughly. So from a mage standpoint, you have this global shift of attention and consciousness to a region that has been, you know, largely ignored up until that point, has has been important but has not been influential in world affairs up until that point, to suddenly where everybody is looking at America and buying American and for a brief period at least like to say they all want to be Americans. Again, that's not necessarily true, but that's part of the illusion. In terms of mage, the technocracy does its you know, great big shift from Europe into the manufacturing base of North America in the 1940s. So in the, by the 1950s, you know, the, the United States and, and Canada are technocracy central. That's where all the focus is. That's where you know the factories are being built. That's where the symposiums are being held, and it looks like this is you know the American century where all the great machines are going to come from, all the great ideas are going to come from, and all the buying and selling is coming from. Underneath that undercurrent, or rather, rather underneath that illusion, there's this undercurrent of discontent, of occultism which really comes into flower in the 1960s, of fundamentalist Christianity, which really you know, comes in to influence in the early 1980s. It gets its hold in the, uh, in the American government uh, under Eisenhower in the 1950s with Billy Graham you know, bringing evangelical Christianity into greater prominence in the, in the government. And the phenomenal disconnect, which is what eventually, where the wheels eventually start to come off in the 1960s, the phenomenal disconnect between the American illusion and the American reality for people who are not middle class or upper class white people. So we have this rapid period of economic growth where even if you haven't been swept up in that tide of benefits that ultimately wound up largely, as you said, uh, affecting middle and upper class whites, there was at least the hope that the sphere of wealth was expanding so much that maybe it would eventually include everyone. So for a period of time, you did have that intense period of post-war hope. And as we scan around the enlightened world, as you said, you have the technocracy picking up focus here. The iterators are taking advantage of the advances in American production facilities. You have the fact that the American uh, university landscape was largely unaffected by World War II, except for a shifting of gear. Years. Like Harvard never got bombed. So mm -hmm. uh, the progenitors and the void engineers are focusing on the new technologies that are coming out. And in the 60s, we have the advent of lasers and microwaves and so on, which I imagine the technocracy would be interested in. Uh, and nukes. Yeah. And <laughs> atomic power and nukes. <laughs> and where do you see the the state of the Nafandi at the eve of the 60s? Uh, in my interpretation, it's one of those things where they were probably prematurely dismissed as no longer being a problem. They're temporarily right. shoved off beyond the, the gauntlet. Garulas is put down. They're, the masters are, are barred. And it seems like there's probably a period where the traditions are just kind of lazy. Yeah, well... <sighs> I think it's more a matter of both the traditions and technocracy get complacent because they figure, as America and Europe figured briefly, well, the, the evil Nazi scourge has been, you know, has, has been destroyed. Yeah, well, of course, as, as we know, one, that didn't happen. Immediately in the wake of World War II, you have the two greatest powers on the Allied side suddenly at each other's throats with neither one of them daring to draw the knife. Again, part of that American illusion is we're told the evil Soviets are coming to, to take over and make us all, you know, godless communists. And on the Russian side, what they've got is the minute we stopped Hitler, Patton and MacArthur wanted to invade us, and, and Churchill wanted to invade us and start the war all over again. Fuck you, that's never going to happen to us again. So immediately you've got this division of the first the first world and the second world, the, the, the capitalist sphere and the communist sphere with everybody else caught in between. And again, that's another thing which obviously, most obviously in Korea in the 50s and Vietnam and Southeast Asia in general in the 1960s, because of course the Vietnam War extends into five or six different countries at that point. 
uh, the key moment that you kind of talk about is the idea that this countercultural revolution occurs, that a bunch of people realize that the wave of prosperity has not yet hit them. We are now firmly into the Cold War geopolitically. The world is seemingly divided between a democratic sphere and a communist sphere or Soviet and a U.S. sphere of some sort. And then what happens then during the 60s? During the 60s is when the difference between the cracks between the illusion and the reality of the American century become really obvious because for people who were not white men, they came back from World War II to, in the case of women, you know, get shoved back into the kitchen. You know, thanks. Thanks for making those tanks and bombs, girls. Now get back there and and make me a sandwich. And for people who were indigenous Americans, black Americans, Jewish and Asian Americans, uh, they were told, okay, now get back in your place. And they're like, how about no? <laughs> and when you consider that, uh, that roughly half of the country was either legally segregated by race at that time or was, you know, like the West Coast, not officially segregated, but you better be out of here by sundown, boy. Even if you happen to be in, you know, Oregon, there were a whole lot of people who came back from the war and just, no, we're not going back to that again. And there were enough influential white men to have faced the horrors of the, the rape of Nankin and the Holocaust to come back and go, you know, no, this is wrong. Between the people who, who were marginalized and, and, and shoved back toward the shadows of the American century who just said, no, I'm not going back and doing this again. And the people, people like Kennedy or Johnson who were segregationists before the war and afterwards said, wow, I was wrong. No, we're not doing this uh, anymore by the early 1960s. You've got Brown B Board of Education, you've got the Civil Rights Act, you've got the assassination of Kennedy, and then you know, you've you got uh, the, the rise of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and their assassinations, the rise of Black Panthers, and so forth, where the cracks widen and the facade falls apart. So it sounds like at least one part of the idea of a counterculture is, one, the revelation that the promise made was not the promise kept and people demanding exactly. that the, those promises be kept. But there was also a, an artistic movement and internal migrations that met with that. You make you made mention of the segregationist cause in the 1950s. So Brown v. Board of Education occurs in 1954, obviously doesn't fix everything. Robert Pershing Johnson refers to the West Coast not having Jim Crow laws, but James Crow laws, which is the slightly more mm -hmm. polite but still equally harmful set of things. We have large yep. internal migrations. The United States is going from a clear urban-rural divide into something where city populations are still increasing on the whole, but generally white people move to the suburbs. Most East Coast or Rust Belt cities have their peak population sometime between 1950 and 1970. 50% of African Americans go from living in the South to in rural areas to distributed across urban areas. So what was the rest of the counterculture besides just the the revelation that this promise wasn't being kept part of it uh, i mentioned a few minutes ago evangelical christianity a particularly strange synthesis uh that, that we're now called the prosperity gospel which comes out of a a, a literal alliance in uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s a literal alliance between anti-communist corporatists and anti-communist evangelicals who made common cause during and after the Great Depression into the 1950s, which is where you see the whole, you know, moral majority, Pat Robertson, you know, Jerry Falwell, and where, which culminates, you know, now in our current era with, well, Donald Trump is the chosen of God. What? <laughs> That, that influence starts coming into not only into society in general, but into government and up through mass media in the 1950s and into the 1960s. And because it's easy for people who don't like evangelical Christianity to dismiss this, but evangelical Christianity is very much a magical mindset. And I say that as a former evangelical Christian. Yeah. Can you outline what you would consider in, in M20 terms, what are the key elements of that paradigm and what are the key elements of practice? The key element paradigm wise is the, the, the world is a battlefield between God and Satan. Well, God's going to win eventually, but this is Essentially, this is the end times, this is the end game, is what we are living in, of this final battle where the forces of Satan, which are, you know, literal demons and devils and evil spirits and so forth, 
are infiltrating government, are infiltrating media, are infiltrating those subcultures. <laughs> the good Christian people need to rally behind that, need to rally behind the government, need to rally behind this particular brand of Christianity. Those other Christians are all bad and need to oppose that rock music and oppose that yo those yoga classes and that mindset is deeply supernatural to the point where you know where now we we are getting the anti-science element of that is much more obvious now but it, again it starts surging up during this era i mean you have the, the scopes monkey trials actually in 19 i think 30s i may be a little bit off on that but by the 1950s you have this breakdown between a deeply spiritual brand of Christianity, which is the, the evangelical you know, demons everywhere, spirits everywhere, angels everywhere, lay on hands, have faith, God will cure this disease, whatever. And the secular Christianity of no, science is the gift of God. These machines and these technologies are, you know, blessings that God has given us. We're not going to say, we're not going to be atheists about it, but no, really, here, take take your pill, take your medicine, drive this car, you know, division between a secular Christianity and a deeply and, and increasingly mystical Christianity, it's very much a part of the world that we see now uh, in terms of mage and paradigm, essentially a division between the technocratic type of, of Christianity Verging in a secularity versus a a particularly I'm going to say tradition oriented, uh, but more extreme members of say celestial chorus would be drawn to that. And you've also, if you're putting this in into mage terms, Nefandi going, oh, look what we have here. That looks like a neat thing we can play with. To go back to your earlier question about the Nefandi, what they're doing, the way I look at it in the aftermath of World War II is going, well, we, we came out of the shadows and we got our asses kicked. So let's go back in the shadows and start playing, you know, basically start pouring water in the cracks and dropping the temperature till the rock shatters. Oh, interesting. I, I like that as a metaphor. And you, and you talk about the religious change, and this to me is a pretty, pretty fascinating one that, I mean, through the 1950s, Christian morality in general was more or less American morality, partially from the fact that you're dealing with a country that at the time is over 80% observant Christians. Then you have the invention of the pill that sets off the sexual revolution and mm -hmm. women's liberation. 1963, yep, yep. I think. And suddenly uh, sexual mores change. And then you mm -hmm. also have the fundamental division of World War II, where America saw itself as the carrying God's banner, having crushed the fascists and going to triumph over the, the godless Soviets, where at the same time, Europe has a crisis of faith. We have held down the line of Roman Catholicism, which was then the largest religion on the face of the planet planet for so long, how from our own mists could this fascist seemingly embracing this weird pagan root come to destroy us? So you have this kind of postmodernism that pervades Europe, the idea that uh, we have a fundamental skepticism of meta narratives, that we cannot go to things for internal meaning. And the end of the 60s see, as you said, the advent of evangelical Christianity, which doctrinally does a few interesting things. One, it says you no longer have recourse you could say the revolution in Christianity that occurred in the 1800s was when people were allowed to read the Bible again. We didn't have to just trust priests. And, and theoretically, that had happened centuries before, but not until you have kind of this later school of German piety did they, that second Protestant Reformation really occur. And here we have almost a step back, which says, no, there is this intensely personal relationship that no one can intrude on, that God will speak to you and God will directly grant things if you worship correctly, and I will show you how. If religion is no longer in the public sphere as much, it now becomes this much more private matter that people have the ability to meddle with or convince you that maybe everyone else is wrong. And and for the longest time, a lot of the Christian groups opposed religiosity and government because the Lutherans didn't want to see the Protestants advance versus Catholics in the public world. But now that the dichotomy became between the, the holy and the godless, it was much easier to have this generic flavor of Christianity. Do you have any thoughts as per what the marauders are maybe like? Quiet but potent. <laughs> and and you, you brought up an interesting thing there because we've been talking a lot about America and Christianity, but that same kind of crisis of faith is, is happening around the world, particularly in, in upper Africa, the Middle East, 
and and in Asia because Eurasia with the Soviet Union, you've got the complete suppression of religious expression, uh, the the complete suppression of regi- religiosity under Stalin in particular, the communists in general, but Stalin in particular. And then when Mao ends up winning that particular civil war that he'd been, he and Chiang Kai-shek had been fighting for a few decades during the Cultural Revolution, again, 1960s, Mao and the, the other Asian communist movements in Cambodia, Vietnam, and North Korea all crack down very, very heavily on Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, and, and Islam in uh, in asia meanwhile over in japan i don't want to talk about this too much because i'm not qualified to talk too much about it but i feel there was a large crisis of faith in japan after world war ii because you know the emperor was supposed to be you know god the emperor was supposed to be a divine figure and yet that divine figure led them into a catastrophic war that literally wound up incinerating their cities. And while you don't have so much of the Christian metaphor of hell there with Buddhism and, and Shinto, there's a large crisis of faith in Japan. You can see it in the media. You can see it in early, uh, in early manga and anime. You see it a lot in the films of Kurosawa, where this breakdown between existentialism, and I'll talk about that in a minute because that actually does tie in, this is the sort of thing that when Brian Campbell, Kathy Ryan, Bill Bridges, Sam Chupp, Howell Going Back, and Judy McLaughlin and I were building the whole foundation of Mage's backstory, talking about stuff like this for hours is what we did. Because it was important to me, and it still is, important to me to root Mage's fictions in our world's realities. All these factors are part of what we view as reality right now. In any case, aside from, and I I don't really know much about South America during this phase, in Asia, North America, Europe, and Northern Africa, that crisis of faith is going on everywhere. In the Middle East, you've got between the establishment of Israel, which just managed to, I don't know, be kind of an influential thing in Middle Eastern history, I'm not sure why, and the rise of a more militant strain of Islam in the wake of World Wars One and Two, where, you know, the Ottoman Empire fell apart after World War One, and the European powers came in and started dictating terms twice in, in 50 years uh, to the um, to the people in, in the Middle East. And finally, by the end of World War II, they were fucking sick of it. India also, after Churchill diverts food supplies from India to feed England and British troops and starves between 4 million to 6 million Indians and Bengalis, depending on whose figures you you follow. Uh, India is sick and tired of Europe's shit. You know, that leads to uh, India breaking off from the British Empire and then breaking into three separate countries, all of which end up having sectarian and religious wars that are still being fought now. All of this stuff is happening, and they're between about 1950 to 1970. For the, uh, I, I guess the key to me for South America is going to be the sheer number of military dictatorships and mm-hmm. leftist regimes that are being thrown over by the U.S. And if you want to insinuate the technocracy in your chronicle, having to throw over a leftist government in South America sounds like a heck of a chronicle that your group may or may not be interested in doing. Or from the other side, trying to thwart the technocratic uh, attempt to do so in Chile or Argentina or or what have you. And as you said, uh, the modern Islamist movement kind of starts in the 60s as the state control of Islam across the Maghreb through the Middle East is kind of being openly challenged for the first time and saying that these this is a watered-down version of Islam. This is not keeping to the law of the prophet. And most of the contemporary Islamist movements kind of draw their intellectual heritage, or at least their political heritage, to some time in the 60s. It reaches its apex probably around this period in 79 uh, with the Iranian Revolution. All the things that are dominating our world now seem to at least be able to find significant intellectual heritage back. You made mention of existentialism as an important idea. What what brings that into the 60s? Postmodernism, existentialism, and the various other avant-garde forms of uh, of art and philosophy come out of between the 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 fin de siècle at the end of the 1800s, where the the Victorian ideals start start crumbling. The end of World War One, which was essentially uh, seen at that time 
as the toppling of reason and the, the, the destruction of, of Europe's entire concept of, of what civilization and reason and rationality are, and then World War II, which just compa- compounds it. What you have by the end of World War II also tie in with uh, the spiritualism, which comes out of the late mid-late 1800s, but really gets a big a firm hold during uh, in the aftermath of uh, World War One. All of these things have brought in a fascination with the irrational and the occult that is, it starts seeping in during World War II or before World War II. I mean, Nazism and Imperial, Imperial Japan has its own strain of that, but I don't know the right words. I'm not going to talk about that. But Nazism is, is literally rooted in, in mysticism. And so by the time the quote-unquote American century illusion starts building and then cracking in the 1950s and 1960s, you've got this fascination with the occult. And that winds up being huge in the 1960s or in 1970s and ends up manifesting in the media ends up manifesting in music ends up in what we you know what we now call with the new age movement and uh, neo-paganism which have their roots in the 1800s and late 1700s really but start to get into mainstream western culture by the 1970s by way of the 1960s countercultures specific the the hippies the satanists and the jesus freaks the Hare krishnas and the beatniks which and all of these things for folks who are listening to this and going oh my god he's talking about all this stuff it didn't just begin in 1960 this is the 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 60s are the culmination of decades worth of of historical momentum that's true metaphysical technological spiritual political economic and ethnic all of these things is by right around 1960 you're seeing this crest of a tsunami that has uh, for which the the shockwaves originated in the late 1700s and just been picking up speed and picking up speed through two world wars and just washes over by the 1960s yeah a lot of the strings you're laying down are clearly also present in the 1890s also another era that occurs after a series of revolutions and wars and you also make mention though that the cult of ecstasy failed so let's kind of redirect to we're having a game during the 60s -hmm. we've talked about what happened during it or what led up to it when i think of a, a game in the 60s my immediate thoughts would be dealing with the push of the new left globally, the push for emancipation and global rights. We have the fact that some 25 nations up till 1970 in Africa go from being directly colonially controlled to Mm -hmm. something else. Those transitions occur to a varying degree of success. All of this taking place in the shadow of the Cold War, as well as the fact that uh, France, the number of nuclear powers is expanding. And now uh, France detonates a hydrogen device in 1968 after detonating a first regular nuclear device in 1960. So if I'm setting a game in the 60s, what are some recommendations you have on what that game can consist of? Well, depending on where you're setting it, where you're setting the game, who your players and who your characters are. You could be doing the swinging London thing, playing like the the Avengers superhero team, but, but the old TV show, the Avengers with the mod clothes and the neat gadgets. James Bond also comes out of this era. That is, that's the era where both the books were originally written, started being written in the 1950s. But the super spy craze in media comes out of the mid 1960s, not just with uh, you know, with James Bond, the Avengers, Ben from Uncle, you know, the Saint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a huge, <laughs> even get smart, huge thing by the mid 1960s. So a, a technocrat game or technocracy based game riffing on James Bond with with your agents, you know, going around trying to put down these weird nefandi or these, you know, mad scientist etherites with their death rays and shit like that. It'd be very easy to look at, say, you know, Dr. No or Goldfinger. You know, as a marauder or as as an etherite that needs to be shut down by some technocrats. You know, you're mentioning a few minutes ago with the the anti-colonial wars in Africa and Asia in particular, South America too, but mostly Africa and Asia, where the people who had been colonialized in the 16, 17, 1800s finally say, okay, no, fuck you, out. 
the characters could be either people who are colonialists who are trying to hold on to their possessions, at which point you have a really ethically problematic game, or it could be people, and not necessarily even dream speakers, that's what everybody thinks of. But I mean, you could have Bata'a, you could have Nagoma, you could have groups that we haven't even named yet because we don't have an African source book that are just going, no, okay, out. You, you had your time, you wrecked our country, out. You could, if, if and I, I wouldn't do this unless you had Asian players and Asian GM, but you could be looking at Vietnam, the intrusion of European and American forces trying to hold onto a colonial hold in a region that's not only tired of it, but divided in terms of, you know, do we want to stick with this modern, this, this modernistic idea or do we want to go back, as, as, as the Khmer Rouge did, to just resetting the whole thing to year zero because we're completely fed up, again, now with the Cultural Revolution too, completely fed up with Western influence and throwing it all out and making our own thing. It's all talking about basis and re, or remaking reality, which is what Mage is about. You could have Wulung and Akashic, Akashiana, and more authentically Asian groups struggling for the, the future of China, which again, also upheaval, cultural revolution, with Japan, with the, the changeover between the mystical imperial technocracy, lowercase technocracy of, uh, of imperial Japan from the late 1800s and through World War II, and a more secular technocracy that says, okay, let's just give up this whole imperial thing and let's rebuild our cities and rebuild our people and take this technology either that we have developed or that we've adopted from these other people and take it to the next level and beyond, which is what you know Japan did. If you want to get imaginative, you could even have a group with, uh, say, Japanese ecstatics establishing the early manga and anime uh, revolution in the, and, and uh, kaiju uh, revolution, again, 1960s. You know, Gorgia comes out 1955, 56, but by the 1960s, Toho is... Money from Toho Studios is one of the major economic factors in rebuilding post-war Japan and establishing Japan as, a, as an international media center. Yeah, and this is, if I, if I remember my mage history correctly, this is still an era where a lot of the Middle East is still largely considered to be under the technocratic thumb, but not for long. Mm -hmm. This is an era where during the, the 1960s, the Batine are still working subtly to trying to throw off the technocratic yoke and maybe even working in some strange way with the Toftani, where their Passover sect, this is like kind of from sykes Pico to the fall of the Shah, that to me represents the mm -hmm. beginning and kind of end of technocratic dominance of the Middle East. So this is a, a game where if you want to have a place where everyone's under the technocratic thumb and you, you are fighting that war of rebellion, that is another theater. It's not an area that I recall us getting a huge amount of information, but from the, the few little bits I remember from the Ali Batin and Taftani, their uh, state of play at the time. Yeah. And one of the, the situations, we've talked about this in previous episodes, but one of the reasons we have so little material about what's going on culturally in, in Africa or in Asia or in South America, simply because when we were laying all of these things down, we didn't have people who could write knowledgeably about it. And so I would have loved to have had laid out this grand global tapestry of all of these different groups who are more culturally authentic, but we just didn't have the resources to do that back in the 1990s. We've been trying to do more of that, and I would have liked to have done more of that with Mage 20 and beyond. There there are whole regions of the world where important things are happening that we hadn't touched on in Mage in the 1990s simply because we didn't have the ability to do it. Even what little bit we did had its problems, but even back then I was going, I don't want to you know, try and write an Africa source book and fuck up. On the plus side, this is now an area where we have a lot of blue ocean for storytellers to kind of tell their own story. There's no canon that you need to worry about going against. Exactly. Yeah, you have the, the virtual adepts joined in 61 after petitioning in, what, 52 uh, or something mm -hmm. like that. The Sons of Ether are kind of firmly established. Otherwise, there's there's a lot of space you get to play in, oh, and God. no one can tell you you're wrong. So Exactly. <laughs> you know, the really obvious mage group that, that, a, that a group of North Americans could play is just simply, you know, being Cult of Ecstasy versus the Syndicate and the NWO and, you know, doing the whole Merry Pranksters. Granted, I think the Merry Pranksters were assholes, but doing the whole Merry Pranksters thing. That's a perfect example right there. Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters is a perfect example of 
both how in real life all of these weird cultural tides and historic tides wound up influencing our approach to reality and also from a from a game standpoint an example of a reality war where the cult just where, where the cult of ecstasy pushed too far and the interesting thing is uh, one of the things you mentioned was the idea of having your james bond like character a lot of the mm-hmm. tropes that we assume about the technocracy have not been set yet If you're going up against a group of black suits, they're probably not the ruthlessly efficient machines we think of from the 90s and onwards. That type of warfare hasn't been invented yet. Uh, The uh, subliminal programming of consume and buy hasn't been perfected yet. This is a technocracy where, sure, they have amazing tools and may still be 30 years ahead of things. But this strikes me as a real case where the the soft technologies of controlling uh, consent and public thought hasn't been established yet. So if you want to do a a game where you do get to cut off what becomes modern consumerism, you you get to, and all all of those tropes just haven't been established yet. Yeah. And in fact, in terms of establishing tropes, the the whole men in black trope comes out of the 1960s. And the war on drugs hasn't been declared yet. It is still that period of experimentation. We haven't had the rise of crack cocaine in cities yet and using that as an excuse to just lock up black people. There are these strange ways in which it is kind of a vacation from the now. Do, Do any other chronicle ideas or any other things that would be unique to this time that you could play come to mind? Again, going back to the, the obvious cult of ecstasy thing, but you've got the the rise. Rock and roll begins in the 1950s, but the funny thing about rock music and rhythm and blues, which became soul music, which is also, thank you, Barry Gordy, winds up being a, a huge socio-political watershed that's not e- easy to see in 1960. But rock looks like it's on the way out by the end of the 1950s because Buddy Holly has died. Elvis went to went into the uh, the army and early rock had been co-opted, uh, Perry Como. And rock was starting to die down as a cultural force until the British invasion in the early 1960s when these British Blues fans like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Kinks and John Mayall and 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 began trying to make their own version of American blues, which the American blues and jazz records had come over into Europe during the 1940s and 50s. By the 1960s, you've got this wave of people in England, which was uh, Great Britain in general, which was really seriously fucked up by World War II and looked like pretty much a dead end for most of the people in it. They start saying, my, my way out of the dead end, my way out of you know spending the, the rest of my life in a factory, in the factory in the pub, is to get an electric guitar and play it really, really loud. That ends up revitalizing rock music as a cult, as a creative, a cultural, and a metaphysical force right around the same time that Stax and Motown start emerging in America, bringing blues and jazz, merging them with uh, some of the influences of rock. And in the case of Barry Gordy and Motown, forming a literal hit factory in which he based a record company on an automobile plant. And in the process of doing that, took blues music and gospel music, which had been something that was almost exclusively considered Oh, for those black people over there, and that's that whole segregated, either legally or or culturally segregated part of town, and polishing it up and smoothing out the rough edges and marketing it to white America. This wound up being huge because most of white America literally had no black people, didn't know about black people, didn't care about black people, and suddenly there's that song that you're 14 and you hear it on the jukebox, or your kid plays on a jukebox, and maybe it's that, you know, that jungle music, it was a nice term for what it was called, but maybe you like it, and maybe, you know, you turn on the TV and see this Elvis guy, or, you know, maybe you see this this Diana Ross person, she's got a nice voice. And the Supremes, well, I like that song that the Supremes did. By the late 60s, Motown and Stax had mainstreamed black culture into white America. And that doesn't seem like a big deal now, but it was a huge fucking deal back then. 
we go from the era where black music is made safe for white audiences by passing it through the filter of Elvis uh, or something like that to people being comfortable listening to black artists, or at least some people being more comfortable listening directly to, uh, to black artists. By the late 60s, you've got Hendrix and you've got James Brown has been popular for a while, but again, getting popular through the 1960s. By the 1970s, James Brown is an icon in America in general, not just in black America. Motown itself, which had begun as this really, as, as the hit factory, literally the hit factory, uh, Hitsville, by the late 1960s, Barry Gordy has been convinced by some of his artists that maybe he should get political after all. And you've got groups like the, Un- the Undisputed Truth releasing overtly political funk, and then, of course, bringing in Mage again, you've got Afrofuturism starts coming in in the late 1960s, too, by way of Sun Ra, Parliament, Funkadelic, and Hendrix. Something that is easy to miss is that that music is, is not only deeply spiritual in certain ways, but it's also futuristic. Hendrix felt that he was making music that connected dimensions. And that's something he actually talked about. He felt like he was channeling different dimensions together and focusing that in through through music as a magical act. And Sly and the Family Stone were doing that. George Clinton was doing that. All of this stuff is emerging from the you know from the subcultures into mainstream culture by the late 1960s, early 70s. The interesting part one of those things that's so (laughs) that's so interesting when you look at it it looks like if if you had written it fictionally it would look too convenient Mm -hmm. is the way that the whole experiment crashed and burned between the end of 1968 and the beginning of 1971 why do you say that the deaths of Jimi hendrix janice joplin Jim Morrison and Brian Jones, the emergence of the Church of Satan with Anton LaVey's Church of Satan and how it went from being a kind of a theatrical gag to, oh, my God, are we actually taking this seriously when he puts a curse on Jane's Man- Jane Mansfield and ends up <laughs> killing her? A event that, according to someone I know who knew who claims to have known LeVay personally, really freaked LeVay's shit out. <laughs> he figured he was just being all theatrical, and, and these people actually died. Altamont, you know, you go from Woodstock to Altamont in, like, less than a year, the Manson murders. The frightening, not just to mainstream America, but even to people on the left, the frightening shift from, from hippie flower children into, you know, Charles Manson murder cultists. And that was a pretty seemingly abrupt shift. Like, I look back at, like, LSD becomes popular as a, a recreational drug starting in, in 67, where you go from uh, maybe 20,000 people trying it in an average year or something like that to to just below a million at the eve of the 1970s. And, and to me, LSD becomes almost a lens for what the modern ascension war is. We have given the masses, we have given sleepers a tool to short circuit what is a traditional method to reach another place. How will they use it? And how are we willing to wage that fight? So it seemed to me like one of those things where the, the mystical factions didn't quite take advantage of it well enough. And the technocracy or the agents of orthodoxy, whatever you want to call them, or maybe even co-opted by the Nefandi overcompensate. And it takes us another 40 years for the power of uh, certain psychedelic drugs to finally be be recognized to the point where we are now openly using a microdosing of LSD as a reasonable treatment for treatment-resistant depression in formal clinical studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we talked about what happened. What, what do you feel ends the 60s? A lot of it is that, that thing I just mentioned, that, that shift from the summer of love into the sucking in the 70s. The LSD and pot start being replaced by heroin and crank in the, the late 60s. The, uh, San, the wheels completely come off the San Francisco scene by the 1960s. Cynicism really kicks in because there's this brief burst of idealism. And again, even like like the American illusion itself that is more of an ideal than it is a reality the collapse of that ideal 
in the in in the 1960s as it starts going into the 1970s if you're looking at it from a mage lens gets the hippie subculture starts to be co-opted by the syndicate and turning it into some of the worst fashions ever made in the <laughs> 1970s it was really really bad music and bad media the, the rise of the bottom mine off talk about references we'll probably get to that in a minute but a film i cannot recommend highly enough the bader meinhof complex which is a uh, a german docudrama about the rise of the red army faction in the late 60s early 70s which begins with a bunch of hippies with some in germany with some perfectly legitimate gripes and you know ends up by the by the, by the early 1970s in a a murderous echo chamber that rise through the again through the night you know from from the 1960s into the 1970s where the left-wing militantism begins piling up a body count we are actually still dealing with the backwash of that now too because when fox news or someone like that wants to trot out a convenient boogeyman they'll pull up the specters of the symbionese liberation army or the red army faction even though those groups haven't existed for decades and they'll say, oh, my God, but but the Antifa is like that. But the, the illusion was such because for all that they didn't actually kill very many people, they were doing things. one of those. We were talking earlier about uh, my early memories. One of my early memories was uh, somebody setting off a bomb at, uh, I believe it was the, the U.S. Capitol. Nobody was hurt, as I recall. And it's barely even remembered now. But talk about a symbolic moment. A bunch of hippies set off a bomb at the Capitol. It, it seems to me that you have this trend of saying there is, through the 50s, there's this illusion that there is one culture that we will all participate in. And the 60s is kind of the re-rising of a number of subcultures or suppressed cultures to fluorescence. And the 70s is the realization of they're never going to let us win. We need to either become violent or we need to go underground. So it mm -hmm. seems like the 60s is this brief moment where you have the passage of the Civil Rights Act and so on, and these advancements before reactionary forces kind of start exerting themselves, and the, the upping of, of, a, of a second Red Scare is kind of an excuse to persecute artists and so on. And that t seems to me is kind of the, the narrative of the 60s. Is that a reasonable thing? A at least one narrative that you can walk away with. Well, that's not even getting into the uh, American Indian movement and uh, the imprisonment of of, uh, of Leonard Peltier, mm. which again, same period. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you've you've got situations like the the occupation of Alcatraz, where uh, you know in, Indigenous Americans, white and black allies said, "No, no, actually, this is their land. Give it back." And the government responds accordingly. Leonard Peltier, that occurs in the 72, uh, and he's finally arrested, I think, in 77. Uh, there's the purported murders in 75, and then he is imprisoned in 77 since. So uh, 43 years of being a political prisoner. Uh, next mm -hmm. scheduled parole hearing is uh, 2024. I remember bringing that up when we were, <laughs> when we were doing the Dream Speaker episode. So uh, a game that wants to wind down by the 70s, what, what do you see were the changes in the magical world? over that period of time for one thing magic and mysticism starts becoming more mainstream both by the hippie white light sort of of thing and the, the jesus freaks you know as we mentioned earlier the jesus freaks and the the um the hari krishnas and and so forth you know bringing the the good magic and let's talk about yoga. Let's bring in these earth spirits. We're going to, you know, we're going to have an Italian do a commercial about being an Indian. We'll be nice and sacred like those Indians over there. From a less sarcastic standpoint, people really do start looking further to outside of Christian influences, especially to Buddhism. By the way, the Beatles. <laughs> Buddhism starts going mainstream in the 1960s and into the, early, into the 1970s. And, and on a darker level, I don't want to blame Satanism because it's a manifestation and actually real-life Satanists are not nearly as, as awful as the Christian alarmists like to portray them. But there is a, a much, much darker, nastier shadow element of metaphysics that comes out of the 1960s and, and starts coalescing in the 1970s, too. And LeVay was playing in the shallows of it. But I know from personal experience and observation that there was there is some deeply fucked up shit that came out of that period, if only because of the legends that grew up around the satanic panic in the late 70s and, and through the 1980s encouraged and inspired some people to actually try and act that shit out. 
I know this because I've known people who did it. One of the reasons I draw some very hard lines around the whole black magic is not cool is because I've known people who've practiced it. I've seen what happens both to them and to other people. From a positive standpoint, I know because I'm familiar with shadow, with shadow craft and shadow art myself, but you have to be very, very careful with that. Part of what comes out of that whole ecstatic swirl in the, the late 60s, early 70s is the idea of, hey, but if, if the man hates it, then it must be good. Give the rich all your money to own the libs. <laughs> yeah, and, and some really pe- people pursuing magic and, and religions with deliberately malign ends. Uh, starts becoming cool and unpacking the shadow in both positive and not so positive way starts coming out out of the subcultures and into the mainstream by way of the uh, the beginnings of heavy metal punk rock and glam rock in the 1960s and into the 1970s if you wanted to you know poetically mark it in terms of bands the velvet underground the mc5 the stooges Al- uh, alice cooper black sabbath Led Zeppelin. Huge shift in terms of the tone just within a period of roughly two years. And it's kind of interesting. Like, historically, mages have done a pretty good job of policing other mages and keeping that darkness out. But once something goes mainstream, all the technocrats of the world and all the traditionalists in the world don't have the power to prevent dark uses of once a magical paradigm has made its way into the public. That is also one of the recurring themes. You make specific mention to the Jesus freaks, and before the before someone just thinks this is just a panning of Christians, this refers to a specific movement, the Jesus movement mm-hmm. that occurred through the, the late 60s through early 70s, where you had, there was always historically a Christian right and a Christian left, but this kind of grew out of the charismatic preacher movement that, that was its precursor and kind of focused on a return of recorded instances of the Acts of the Apostles, that appropriately fervent worship would give you access to prophecy and foreknowledge and miraculous healing and so on. And that has continued into a number of evangelical churches that are still around in the U.S. The Jesus movement itself kind of died down in 1972, but that's only because a lot of the aspects of it got organized and eventually co-opted or consumed by organizations like the Campus Crusade for Christ uh, and early conservative Christian leaders like uh, Bill Bright and Billy Graham. That, to me, is a specific thing. And I would love to see a game of choristers trying to make sense of this. Mm-hmm. Well, especially since, and, and this is something that's easy to miss, you know, with the co uh, the, 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 the way that uh, the evangelical movement has, has been co-opted into Trumpism, there is also a deeply leftist strain of evangelical Christianity. And it's not easy to see now. You don't see a lot of people, you know, being highlighted in the media that way. But it was very influential, especially during the Great Depression and into the 1960s, where Instead of Christians, you know, going, well, you know, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. The people who were taking the specifically the Sermon on the Mount to heart and saying, no, it is Christ-like to take care of people. It is not Christ-like to be greedy. It is it is unchristian to be violent. And that leftist Christianity is still it still exists, but it was really, really strong in uh, again 1960s into the early 1970s. What are your thoughts, and I am about to do the thing I can't stand when other people do, where you use a <laughs> tradition name to stand in for a, a paradigm, but how do you see more high-ritual organizations making it out of the 60s? So I, I'm thinking of traditional hermetics. What do you think happened to them? And the other one that I, I feel like we haven't really talked about is the, the euthanatoi or the verbena. What do you feel their <laughs> lot was? So talking about that, that whole pop cultural surge, one of the other things that, that comes out of that fascination with irrationality and the way that it, it's brought into pop culture is modern fantasy. Although Edgar Rice Burroughs was writing in the early 1900s and H.P. Lovecraft, uh, Robert E. Howard and so forth were, were writing in the 1930s, it really gets popular. And Tolkien, of course, came out in the 1940s, 50s. It hits popular culture during the 1960s. The Lord of the Rings becomes a bestseller during the 1960s. <clears throat> Ballantine Books brings Conan into, into print. Boris Vallejo and, and Frank Frazetta end up popularizing the entire look of sword and sorcery, which becomes, again, 
mainstream, the people who were, you know, teenage and older who were reading that stuff in the 1960s and early 70s, a lot of those people went on to be either pursue real magic and or start making magical traditions or recreating or creating entire new approaches to magic based on that. You know, Crowley became a superstar, <laughs> a pop culture superstar. 1960s again, his, Crowley's on the cover of uh, on the cover of Sgt. Pepper for a reason. So when you're talking about the Hermetics and the Verbena, they would be going, you know, hmm, I think the ecstatics have got an idea here. Oh, look, these people are suddenly interested about witchcraft. I'll teach you about witchcraft. <laughs> Want to know about the real witchcraft? These books seem to be very fascinating. Let me go and talk to these people over here. Yes, hi, my name is Gandalf. Yeah. <laughs> and this is also an interesting thing. We haven't talked about the, the Society of Ether or the Virtual Adepts as much, but if you follow the second edition and revised idea that the science fiction literature movement was kind of a hidden war against the technocracy, this is the age when utopian science fiction kind of <laughs> gives way to something else. We have Sam Delaney doing his Harlan. work. Uh, Slaughterhouse Five comes out, The Drowned World by J.G. Ballard. Uh, the Man in the High Castle, which I didn't realize until I was doing research for this, came out 17 years after World War II. Like, in my head, there was a lot more distance there. Uh, we get The Left Hand of Darkness, Ursula K. Le Guin uh, writing her Known Universe series. Uh, Wrinkle in Time comes out in 62. Sci-fi uh, children's book, uh, children in air quotes. 2001, Frank Herbert's Dune comes out. The era is ripe for possibility for the Society of Ether, and the realization of the downside of technology hadn't quite fully seemingly sunk in yet. Everyone was taken back by the, the dawn of the nuclear age, but it seemed like to the utopianists that was just a temporary blip that we had to use this technology once to devastating effect. But now by the time the 60s are closing, we're kind of getting a full idea of some of the negative repercussions of the technologies we've created that we haven't quite decided to deal with yet or need to come up with ideas. Yeah, the Cuyahoga River literally catches on fire in 1969. <laughs> so uh, we, we get the idea that the, the utopia that we thought we had created after the war really is really is shattering. Something else that ties in with that that says again very much a, a part of the, the a part of the '60s, both in terms of the, the, the political movements and, and technology, is the whole mind control idea, psychodynamics. That that entire MK Ultra again mm -hmm. 1960s, the concept of brainwashing, the concept that you can you know take somebody and and put them you know put them in a room, put them in a chair, whatever it is, the terror that your conscious mind could be taken away from you through some sort of, of malignant, malign, you know, malign technology is prevalent and really starts becoming a myth. And I mean that in the, you know, mythopoetic sense, not in the sense of it's a lie, it, again, in the 1960s. And that's not entirely wrong. Ken Kesey, the merry prankster who went around with his rainbow bus there dosing normals to try and you know open their minds and change their view of reality was a survivor of mk ultra his mind was opened by lsd experiments by the cia in the late 1950s early 1960s could you give a quick overview of what project mk ultra was mk ultra was an experiment black books experiment by the u.s government in uh, mind control using psychoactive drugs well using psycho yeah psychoactive drugs and uh, trauma ther uh, trauma therapy really but uh, trauma techniques to see how much the human mind could be reprogrammed and by what methods and that started in 53 it's reduced in scope in 664 it really winds down to 67 and not until the 90s did we actually get a fuller accounting of things like I remember being a kid and hearing about my crazy uncle being right for once and that mm -hmm. kind of <laughs> that was a oh, son of a gun maybe I need to listen to Uncle Mark more um, but <laughs> but uh, supposedly volunteer soldiers being being dosed and it's remembered largely for the LSD stuff but like in terms of the other techniques that were being tried electroshock chemical treatment hypnosis sensory, sensory deprivation verbal and sexual abuse forms of torture are tested it's not exactly a, a shiny happy time to be there. And if we want to bring that into our game, I, I think the, the moral quandaries that any technocrat is going to face and being like, hey, look at this cool thing the sleepers came up with. Let's do it too. And someone <laughs> being like, wait, we're the good guys though, aren't we? Why would we do this? It is still a time in which the monolithic good guy technocracy is is a theme that can really be played on with much less satire than a contemporary game would require. <laughs> 
mm-hmm. as far as the the utopian technology you know, going going back to uh, the whole super spy thing, you could totally play that off from an etherite standpoint too. Whether is James Bond a technocrat or an etherite really depends on how you want to play it, doesn't mm-hmm. it? I mean, hell, you could look at the Batman TV series as an etherite or an etherite marauder. <laughs> I, I think we've talked about a, a fair number of mage groups. Are there any other sleeper movements that if someone is like, hey, I want to come up with a new practice or a new paradigm based on what was happening in sleeper magic communities that you could recommend that people look into? For starters, for really look at the increase in, in fascination and practice with Buddhism and Tantra as they were being pursued more vigorously in the Western world. Yoga starts being brought into the the Western world around the turn of the uh, 1800s, early 1900s. A fascination with Buddhism and Tantra really starts to catch hold in Europe and the Americas during the 1960s. Again, by way of the Beatles and uh, the Maharishi and I'm blanking on his full name. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mahesh Yogi is the inventor of modern transcendental meditation. Yes. Um, Okay. Thank you. Ravi Shankar, who, you know, goes from a famous Indian musician into being a global icon again during the 1960s. For people who actually have access to, to an authentic treatment of specifically Buddhism or Hinduism, making more of a craft around that or making, you know, bringing that more into the game, especially as, as it's being introduced into the uh, in, into Europe and the Americas, you could do a lot with it. Also, we could, somebody else another 60s icon we completely forgot about bruce lee yeah before we hit the bruce lee i really like the idea of the the blossoming of those spiritual movements and suddenly the thanatoics are taking are paying attention to north america in a way mm-hmm. they never did before and that also provides a tr- a framing where you can have your characters more or less discover the 60s while the players are to have that outsider yeah. experience that you're like okay you need to go figure this out if the players aren't well versed in it already, that their ignorance would mirror the character's ignorance, which tends to be a rather potent role playing tool. As someone is like, "Hey, this thing is is appearing on the West Coast. Go figure out what's happening at this meditative retreat where people keep seemingly either disappearing or coming out claiming that they've become enlightened." You, you mentioned Bruce Lee. This is the the advent in the West, at least, of the Hong Kong action film. What kind of cultural milieu does that come out of? And again not being nearly as versed in Chinese culture and history as I would like. My impression is, here's the salt shaker. My impression yeah. is there were, were, there were a hell of a lot of people who were jumping ship from Asia during the cultural revolution, during Mao's crackdown and who were just going, okay, I'm going to either go over here to Hong Kong or I'm going to go over here to this American place because at least I don't have a, you know, I don't have a death, death squad trying to kill me. Historically speaking, there's a a growing fascination with Asian martial arts forms from the mid 1800s into the into the 1970s. But with Bruce Lee and Jun Ri, the uh, Korean uh, martial artist who uh, comes over into the Americas and starts popularizing Korean martial arts and Japanese martial arts in the 1970s. I know this because I remember watching the commercials for Jun Ri's karate school when I was a kid in the 70s. That fascination starts coming in by way of popular culture during the late 1960s, more into the 70s, but starts coming in the late 1960s, especially when movie stars like John Saxon and budding movie stars like Chuck Norris, as well as actors and athletes, Jim Brown and others whose names I'm blanking on, start training with, specifically with Bruce Lee, but start training with uh, with martial arts teachers, popularizing, it's called, largely called karate in, in, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, but it's actually much deeper and much broader and not necessarily Japanese. During that period, the Shaw brothers in, I believe it's Hong Kong, but I'm not entirely sure. But the Shaw brothers start realizing, like the Japanese filmmakers realized in the uh, in 1950s and 1960s, that there was a whole lot of money in making quick, wild movies that you could sell to uh, to international markets. You could make them cheap, make them fast, and sell them worldwide and make, you know, make a whole lot of money. 
And that's a period oh, where God. the Shaw brothers are, are banging out something like 20 movies mm-hmm. a year, uh, oh, which, cool. which needless to say is impressive. And, and to go back to Bruce Lee for a second, one of the things I'm not quite sure how I would integrate, but I think would be, I'd love your commentary on, is this is uh, when Jeet Kune Do is appearing for the first yep. time. The idea of this traditionless martial arts mm-hmm. tradition, for lack of a better term, that we are separating the practice almost from the, the culture that produced it. And this, to me, seems like a very obvious literalization almost of what the syndicate tries to do, uh, maybe with malicious intent and mages sometimes uh, fail to do. What is your reading, uh, if you have one, of, of kind of the advent of these modern interpretation of classical forms, um, whether it be in martial arts or, or music and attempt to come up with these placeless things like prog rock drawing on instead of going back to rock and roll, instead of going the other way and saying like, hey, we're white people, we're going to go back to the music of white people so get in there baroque music those are kind of two dissident <laughs> thoughts but if you <laughs> well one of the fascinating things about this period just on every level metaphysically politically spiritually artistically musically is that because as we were talking about i don't know like two hours ago because there was such a a, a sense of the foundations being shattered and the illusions being shattered there's a sense that anything goes and that means if you can recreate your reality, your reality, then do it. And that there's an actual 1960s phrase along those lines. I'm blanking the blanking on the exact word, but the idea of making your making your own reality, or remaking your own reality in your own image, is a very 1960s idea. And whether you're doing that with martial arts, whether you're doing that with creating a magical tradition, whether you're doing it with creating new forms of music or new forms of art, other art because music, music is an art. Uh, whether it's inventing or trying to invent a new national government like the Khmer Rouge did with kind of ugly results, but that's still what they were attempting to do. Start over, reboot. Reboot's not a word that exists in the 1960s. It's very true to the spirit of that time. And the, the legend of what was done to Bruce Lee would actually make for an interesting mage chronicle, the idea that the traditionalist masters felt that they needed to take out this upstart for, for his blasphemy against their sacred traditions and exposing their sacred traditions could be a, the inspiration, even if you're not using Bruce Lee per se, that concept of the, the old masters going, no, that wasn't, you weren't supposed to do that, and hunting the student down for blaspheming against the, uh, the old way or merchandising the old way or introducing it to people who it was taboo to introduce it to would be a, a very major chronicle idea. It, it seems like a, an interesting idea would be a, a group has to, if you want to do the time travel chronicle either cause or prevent any one of these events from happening like you you've listed at this point a half a dozen things that really draw the dream of the 60s to a close what does it look like in a world of darkness where there are mages that maybe are able to continue that spark what does modernity look like if lsd is never criminalized in the same way or if the syndicate gets a hand on it sooner and makes it as dull as newport lights uh, what kind of <laughs> what kind of mage world does that create? And one of the fun things about talking about a period is the small things that we could change that would make a wildly different world. If you have to think of any of the events of the 60s that a, a troop or a mage cabal could insert themselves in to create a radically different future with, with seemingly small intercessions, are there any events that come to mind that, that a small mystic nudge could have really changed things? Or Yeah, tell the Rolling Stones not to hire the Hells Angels to provide, ser- to, to to provide, provide security, uh, security and yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, stop. And it's funny. I was thinking about this when when we started talking about Bruce Lee, the film Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Mm -hmm. the the way that Tarantino presents his alternate history of the Sharon Tate, you know, Manson killings, going in and stopping Charles Manson, Mm -hmm. stopping Altamont, keeping Martin Luther King or or uh, or Malcolm X alive, stopping the assassination of of Malcolm X or, or, you know, stopping preventing the, the the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. If you really wanted to turn things around, prevent the Kennedy assassination, then you're rewriting the whole 1960s and everything forward from there. Other things, Khrushchev is expelled from office in 64. Uh, uh, one, if you, again, I, I always think the Celestial Chorus over the last two centuries needs a little bit more love and needs less love prior to that. Uh, but you have the phenomenon of Vatican II and the advent of what becomes yeah. modern Christianity. You have primitivist movements in both Christianity and, and Islam that pop up of we need to go back to uh, living the lifestyle 
in, in terms of uh, when our prophet or savior was around, and that could go from we need to stone people who commit adultery, or it could just be we need to wear more wool. There was really a remarkably <laughs> wide thing yeah. in there. At the same time, 63, we get our first touchstone telephone, which kind of allows the modern virtual adepts to exist. The LED is invented. The laser is invented. Unix comes into existence. And we haven't even touched on the space race uh, mm-hmm. in, in terms of things. So there's kind of right pickings. And if anyone finds any of these ideas intriguing or wants to do more homework, uh, where would you recommend they go? Uh, I just finished reading, and of course I put it on a shelf in another room. I just finished <laughs> reading a fantastic book a few days ago called The Subversive History of Music. And it covers a lot of the things that we've been talking about, where they pertain to music. I'm going to be making that a, a strong recommendation for Mage fans in general, because he's addressing not only music, but the way that society and music and metaphysical approaches are, all influence each other. I recommend the films, like I mentioned, Once Upon a Time in uh, in Hollywood and The Butter Meinhof Complex. Could also watch, if, watch some old Sean Connery, James Bond films, because I think that'd be a hell of a lot of fun, mm-hmm. personally, or... You know, watch some old episodes of The Avengers or The Prisoner. The Prisoner is also a 1960s British TV series. Uh huh. I, that, that, <laughs> that I can certainly get behind. It's it's so weird to listen to look at those episodes now and like they are 56 minute episodes. <laughs> like <laughs> you went through an hour of television with four minutes in commercial and other crap. Wow, the 60s really were a were a different time. Oh, The Doors, the movie The Doors. The other thought I had was Gimme Shelter, which to me is kind of the definitive documentary on the difficulties, for lack of a better term, at the uh, Altamont Speedway Free Festival. Uh, Something Ceteris brought up a couple of times. This was something I only was aware of in doing research for it, but it was kind of intended to be the the Woodstock of the West, which failed terribly. It was was racked by violence. There were two hit-and-run car accidents, three sudden deaths. One was induced by someone on LSD drowning, a number of acts that were Pin to go on, never actually did. The Grateful Dead kind of be like, nope, this isn't going to be our time to shine. As you said, the uh, the Hell's Angels being hired as security possibly for uh, $500 in beer maybe wasn't the best the best choice. <laughs> well, the movie Malcolm X also. And uh, the documentary Standing in the Shadows of Motown. Uh, the uh, the documentary Four Little Girls, Clockwork Orange, although that that's technically technically came out in the early 70s but um, but the, the book was written in the ni- in the 1960s and the film is 72 yeah. if i'm not mistaken uh, it, so still technically part of the 60s yeah instead of clockwork orange i'd probably grab manchurian candidate yeah um, the manchurian candidate uh, yeah yeah a pl- political thr- thriller about the cold war if you don't have anything else to recommend we have grilled you exhaustively on this what else are you up to that the audience may be interested in my collection of self-owned short fiction, Valhalla with a Twist of Leaf, is currently at press. Probably by the time this episode airs, it will be available for at least pre-order, if not uh, immediate order. That is going to be available in print, audiobook, and Kindle editions. And I've been absolutely loving the uh, the process of doing the audiobook, both that audiobook and uh, the audiobook of my novel Red Shoes with my collaborator Ivory T- uh, Ivory Tyler Blair, who is wonderful. She's a audiobook reader, singer, and actor who is also like kindred spirit and stuff who's just marvelous and has done fantastic stuff with uh, uh, with my work and working with her on these projects has been a joy my novel red shoes which is also self-owned when i say self-owned i mean these are not mage uh, they're not world of darkness they're not somebody else's intellectual property they're mine Valhalla with a twist of leaf is a collection of my fiction published uh, over the last 30 years i'll have a second one coming out fairly shortly because I had to leave a lot of things out of this one. Red Shoes is an urban fantasy novel set in my uh, fictional city of Riverhaven, which is kind of a a cross between Atlanta, Seattle, San Francisco, and Asheville, North Carolina, where I used to live. That is currently in layout. The cover will be by Echo Chernick, who is, you know, famous to uh, to mage fans uh, as H.J. McKinney. I am going to be getting back to my Mage Storyteller Vault book, Fallen Companions. My book, Mage Made Easy, is available on the Storyteller's Vault and has been selling extraordinarily well. And more importantly, people are really, really enjoying it. I am, I am glad it exists. 
Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I am certainly not the target audience for it, but I'm glad it is something I can, I can recommend to other people. And I feel like uh, Mage Made Easy is kind of uh, step one, and I don't in any way say this derisively, to the Dungeons and Drag- Dragonsification, hopefully, of the old world of darkness, where we say, this is what the player needs to know. This is what the storyteller needs to know. This is the actual thing you get to play. Go have fun and do it. Of, of making that the smoothest on-ramp we can go from, huh, this looks interesting, to I'm sitting down at a table, uh, actual or virtual, with friends, and we're playing the damn game. So thank you for that. And with that, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Terry. Always, always good talking with you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to Mage the Podcast, which has not yet been found to cause cancer per California's Proposition 65. The show is made possible by its executive producers, which includes Anders, Andrew K, Andrew E, Brendan, Bryce Perry, Christopher P, Chris Sack, Ira Grace, Jenna F, Justin, John Magnuson, Michael Parker, Richard Bat Brewster, William, and Jay Sunsern. My executive producer shout-out for this episode is Michael Parker, who I thought I heard get a shout-out in another podcast, which I initially made think they were betraying us, but then I realized that you can support more than one show, to which I say thank you. In doing some digging, I also found out that Michael is one of the founding members of the Rosicrucians, donated to help pay for the second inlet tower at the Hoover Dam, covered the cost of having Iowa added to the World War II monument in Washington, D.C. when it was finished and people realized there were only 49 states, provided the necessary funding to allow Rent to finish its initial off-Broadway run, and is currently spending spare time developing a novel career a virus cure. Thanks, Michael. If you'd like to become an executive producer, get a chat, color, and discord, and have me make up things about you periodically, as well as receive our executive producer-only podcast, So What's Your Plan? You can become one by clicking on Become a Supporter in the show notes, or through the episode entries in our webpage. If you super liked this episode, or super didn't, drop us a line at matesthepodcast at gmail.com, or at matesthepodcast on Twitter. We have a hop in Discord community at discord.me slash matesthepodcast. You can subscribe to our show on Spotify, Anchor, TuneIn, iTunes, Google Play Podcasts, or the podcatcher of your choosing. If you like us, please give us a review on the platform of your choosing and tell a friend about us. Also, go to matesthepodcast.com for show notes and all of our previous shows. Now go change reality. Bye!